Do you get a robe or like, what do you get? What's the... <laughs> I'm working on it, Scott. I'm working on it. <laughs> All right, here we go, gentlemen, on the count. Three, two, one. Welcome in, everyone. It is the Causeway Classic here on Experience the Buzz. That's right, a little timely episode for you. And I am so excited to bring in four gentlemen. That's right, this is going to be the largest conglomeration of talent in one spot, not including myself. I'm talking about the other four. We have got, from the Sac State side, we've got Jason Ross and Steve McElroy. They are the radio voices of Sac State football. And in representing UC Davis, we've got Scott Marsh and Doug Kelly. So, gentlemen, welcome. Let's go ahead and get the voices. So, for the people out there, you know, they can kind of take in who is who. We will start with, now, UC Davis is hosting this game. So, we'll start with the Aggie crew. Scott Marsh, how are you today? Doing great, Buzz. I really got to say, it's really three to two Aggies because you are the first voice of the Aggies. I was, I, I was going to th I was going to throw that in later, you know, but okay. Scott is now the voice. And of course, we'll get into kind of the history and stuff because I did 14 years and now Scott is going on his 15th year. But the man who's been there for a long time, Doug Kelly, DK, how are you? I'm great, Steve. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. So great to talk to you. It's been a while. And then we flip over to the Sac State side and we got Steve McElroy. Steve, how are you doing today? I am doing great. Now, Buzz, you might have announced for the Aggies and I announced one time with you back in 1996. But you've lived in Sacramento forever, Buzz, so I wouldn't really call you an Aggie. There we go. Okay, and then we go to Jason Ross, who, by the way, Jay Ross, and uh, we just mentioned this, the first two-time Experience the Buzz episode guest. I mean, congratulations. You're back. It's an honor. I can't believe you're having me back. <laughs> well, I was really excited. I came up with the idea last week. I'm like, you know what? Causeway Classic is just around the corner. And the beauty is, is that not only is it a rivalry, but boy, we've got two teams doing very well. So what I want to do is really talk about the history of this great rivalry. When we think of rivalries, they go all over the place, all over sports and stuff. But you guys have been a big part of it. I mean, think about it. As a collection in this group, we have seen a lot of games between the Aggies and Hornets. So, Scott, we will start with you because you're a UC Davis grad, so you enjoyed it as a student. You've enjoyed it over the course of the years. What does the Causeway Classic mean to you? Yeah, no, it's extremely special, Buzz, as you know. I was thinking this is going to be my 33rd Causeway Classic that I've seen going back to, to 1989, if my math is correct. Hopefully that's correct. 32nd, maybe. But anyways, it, it's just been a, a part of my life, you know, for over half my life now. And, you know, when it's been at Hughes Stadium, there's been 20,000 people there. We've seen games played in monsoons. We've seen the Aggies think they're going to make the playoffs only to lose at Hornet Stadium. And, so you have everything that it should be in a rivalry that's only separated by a hunk of slab across a, a causeway here. Yeah, all started in 1954, and it's interesting because uh, I'm a numbers guy. Um, so I believe this is the 67th Causeway Classic, but the 68th meaning. And you guys, I really tried hard, but this is episode number 66. So I missed it by just, just a little bit. DK, the Causeway Classic, you've been a big part of it. Many of them, um, I know you have great memories uh, with this uh, great rivalry. Well, Steve, I tell you, my first one was in 1996. And uh, I remember particularly the one in 2000 when we played it at um, Hughes Stadium. And it just poured. Rain. Yes. And uh, J.T. O'Sullivan completed a long pass to Aname Ojo for the only touchdown in the game. I think it was a 10-7 to 7 score or something like that. But, oh, man, I, I remember Hasseltine was on the sidelines, and I thought he was going to get hypothermia. So we got him in the car, brought him as far as my house. I threw him in a hot shower, <laughs> and the rest is history. And the question is, was he drinking before that game? <laughs> no, I think he was, he was well prepared for that one. Uh, he might have had a few afterward, but uh, oh, he's, uh, he's grown up a little bit since then. Just a little bit. And now let's flip over to the Hornet side. And uh, Steve, uh, again, I mean, it's crazy because, because yeah, 24 years uh, with you and Jay. And I know UC Davis had a lot of, you know, big runs and stuff. But there were some great Sac State victories within those years that you guys have been on the air. Well, first, I have to say that that 2000 game, we had three offensive linemen that made it to pro camps. And then the other one 
was the starting center Lonnie Paxton for the Patriots for years. We had Charles Roberts who rushed for 2,260 yards that season, also had a 400 yard game. I thought we were gonna win that game you know, by 30 points. And I remember going to Hughes Stadium, it was gonna be packed, it was supposed to be. And I couldn't be more excited to finally just beat the crud out of the Aggies. And I even went in the locker room, that old crummy locker room in Hughes Stadium before the game, and I was just so excited. So those cheers turned south as the rain was blowing sideways. It was a brutal game. And at the end of the game, when it was still close, obviously it was close throughout, the Hornets missed a tackle and the Aggies got the 80-yard touchdown. We couldn't see out our window because the, the press box at Hughes Stadium at the time hadn't been remodeled. But we look over at Coach Peelstick, our offensive coordinator, and those guys, they can't see out their window to see the field to call the plays. And we're like, how are we going to come back and score when our coaching staff can't even see the field? And so I'll move to the positive. The positive was um, we had a Lamont Webb touchdown in the home game against the Aggies because they moved it to Hornet Stadium. And we ended up winning the game prior year uh, in 99 against the Aggies. And Jason, for you, just like Scott Marsh, I mean, I don't know if a lot of people know it, but like you're UC Davis grad as well. So it's interesting, you know, McElroy makes the comment toward me of living in Sacramento by having worked for the Ags. But I guess in terms, you truly went to the dark side because you graduated from UC Davis, went to Sac State. But I'm sure it's been uh, it's been a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's I would say it was harder earlier, especially my college roommates. When I had just gotten the job at Sac State, they couldn't believe it. They gave me grief all the time. But, yeah, I've experienced it as a student, as an Aggie broadcaster, and now as a Hornet broadcaster for so many years. And then I think about it. It's funny just the perspective to hear Doug and Steve talk about 2000 because I was with Steve. I thought that was the best Hornet team. I I went into that the same way Steve did. I was certain the Hornets were going to win. And then it's one of the great Aggie wins they've ever had. And I think about games at Hughes, at Toomey, at Aggie Stadium, at Hornet Stadium, and even at Reno a couple of years ago because of the, the smoke. So this rivalry has been great. It's been played everywhere. And then this year will be one like any other. We've never had one like this this year. And let's go ahead. We'll just jump into it. I know I had said earlier coming on that maybe we'll wait to the end to talk about the game. But that is the main reason for this conversation is because with this Causeway Classic, there is a lot on the line, like more so than we've ever seen. And Scott, we'll go back to you and maybe talk to, uh, talk about it from the Aggies perspective. The first time where both teams are ranked in the top 12 in the country, UC Davis is 10th currently, Sacramento State's 11 right now in the, the latest media poll. Uh, this game really probably will be played for a first round home buy. So uh, buying the first round in a home game for the second round, and the loser is going to have to play in the first round, maybe on the road. So there's a ton of things going on in this game Saturday, not just the rivalry, but it's got huge FCS playoff ramifications. It's one of the biggest games going on in the nation right now. And that's what's fun to have both teams playing so well. I don't think we've had a causeway where we've had two teams at the same time rank this high and playing yeah. so well. Yeah, and DK, because I think there's only been one other time in the late 80s in which they played in the playoffs, but it was a much different landscape than it is now. And I think that's what makes this year so impressive. Like these two teams are legitimate and people are looking at them across the nation within this division. Well, they sure are, Steve. And I'll tell you, I've, I've never seen a causeway with this much riding on it as we will have on Saturday. Um, you got two really good, well-coached, football teams uh the records obviously are uh, pretty darn close and um you know sac state's played a, a great schedule and they've come out very well and you know you knew that when they hired troy taylor that uh, some things were going to change from what they had been and that uh, troy has certainly um, lived up to uh, everything that everybody thought he was when he was coaching at Folsom high school and then was the uh, oc at um, I think Eastern Washington for a year and at Utah for a couple of years before he came home, literally. So um, yeah, it's, it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, uh, I think it, it'll get down to whoever makes the fewest mistakes. Now, that's usually who wins and loses football games. Absolutely. I, and you know what, that is a true DK nugget right there, right? Just the, <laughs> it's the obvious thing. It's like, you know, you just get right down to it. That's what I miss. <laughs> I missed that. Oh my gosh. Me, I just like brought back memories. Let me well, ask you know, um, question. Yeah, Steve. 
McElroy, that, go ahead. The last time that they played twice in a season, what year was that? And, and who won those games when they did play twice out of the 68 meetings? Oh, he's setting it up. He's teeing it up. Oh, yeah. the, the Aggies have won 18 straight games, Steve. Uh, that, uh, the question was uh, <laughs> objection and non-responsive. The question was to DK. You know what's you know what's funny? I think McElroy is the instigator of all this kind of the trash talk, right? Jay doesn't do it. DK will only respond if he needs to in terms of it. Scott Marsh, maybe on a little bit of the edge, but he's not gonna be the instigator. It's all McElroy. I am calling that out right now. Is that true, Steve? Do you embrace that? I fully embrace it, and we would get a 6-0 vote on that. I will say this. I've been doing a radio show with Scott once a week, and now he's getting to be like me. He fights back against me. And so I'll, I can take it, though. At least some people that dish it out all the time can't take it. I will say this, that in 88, the Hornets might have won twice and won in the playoffs. But, Scott, you didn't start going to the Causeways till 89. So in your lifetime, it's just been a storybook journey. Yep, I skipped that year with good reason. All right, <laughs> Jason, I knew this conversation was going to be like this, but that's what I love about it. I love these guys right here. Jason, um, you know, you and I, when we talked and did your episode, which by the way was episode number four, one of the very first episodes of Experience the Buzz, we talked about that transformation a little bit about Sac State. It, it has been pretty incredible. I would agree that there are a lot of great players that come through, and I'm sure we'll mention some of those. But Charles Roberts, to me, was like hands down the guy you wanted to see, and he got stymied by Mother Nature on that particular day. But this transformation with the coaching staff, with Troy Taylor and the fulsome kind of that fulsome integration into Sac State, really has made this team exciting. Not just this year, but now it's been a couple years. Yeah, I was thinking about this buzz as far as this game goes. This is I remember having these conversations vividly with you. I know with Steve and I have with, certainly with Scott and Doug about just the phrasing, could you imagine if Sac State or UC Davis was ever really good in the big sky? Or could you imagine if they were playing the final game with one of the teams having a chance to go to the playoffs? Well, this one, there's a safety net. Both are going. The loser's still in. To Scott's point, maybe it changes their playoff seating. But to show how far the coaching has come for Sac State and for Davis, Buzz, this is going to be the third straight causeway that somebody's playing for the Big Sky title. Wow. In 2018, Davis was. They won. They won the title. 2019, Sacramento State was playing for it. They won. They won the title. And the Hornets are playing for it again this year. I mean, that's three years in a row in the causeway that someone's playing for the conference title. And now, in this case, if UC Davis wins, they don't win the conference. They're just going to increase their playoff seating. So these two programs have come so far. There's been too many causeways where it's four and six versus four and six. It's still fun. But eight and two versus eight and two makes this awesome this week. And Doug Kelly, let me let me switch it over to you because with the Aggies, it also has been an interesting transformation. I have to be honest with you, like, you know, my memories are Bob Biggs, right? And and mm -hmm. that coaching staff. And I was just talking to someone at a wedding who happened to be UC Davis grad that loved football. And those were the people that we were talking about. And now I admit I don't have as much of a touch on the Aggie program, I follow Scott, I follow you guys and everything, but maybe kind of fill people in on where UC Davis is at when we speak of this team in 2021. Well, Steve, it really started when uh, Dan Hawkins came back to the UC Davis campus. Uh, after Bob Biggs retired after 2012, uh, they went outside the program and hired Ron Gould to be the head coach. and. Ron, Ron has many skills as a position coach. I don't really think he was a head coach. He just wasn't so inclined that way. The record was not good. We were 12 and 31 and needed a change. And, um, you know, very few people know this, but Dan was on the verge of taking an offensive coordinator job under Butch Davis at Florida International. And Butch Davis just got canned the other day. So I'm sure that the Hawk feels he made the right decision. But, but you know, Dan came in and put together a really solid staff. His son, Cody, is the offensive coordinator. Uh, there's an up-and-coming young man as the defensive coordinator, uh, Matt Coombs. Um, and it's just, it's just been a night and day transformation. And let's face it, guys, I think we would uh, all agree on this one that at the end of the day, it gets down to coaching. And uh, there are two very, very excellent head coaches here. 
and they're going to be matching wits on Saturday, and uh, we'll let the chips fall where they may. And that is going to uh, cinch up what is segment number one. We are going to take a break, and when we come back, we're going to talk more. Steve McElroy, Jason Ross, Sac State, Doug Kelly, Scott Marsh, UC Davis. It is the Causeway Classic. We will actually be releasing this one a little bit early so you can enjoy the conversation and get ready for what is going to be a great game. It's going to take place on Saturday at 1 o'clock. It'll be at UC Davis, and we'll get all the details for you um, as we move through this show. So take that break. want to thank our sponsors. we got five great ones. Big thank you to R5 Stitch and Print. Pit Boss Jerky, the official beef jerky of Experience the Buzz, Little Whale Swim School, Matt the Mortgage Guy, and Suncrest Hospice. We'll be back right after this. All right, segment one in the books. Thank you, guys. Good job. Well done. Well done. Stingers up. No, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Scott. Let's go, Brandon. Oh, man. By the way, Marsh, your, your sound is not great, but we're, we're getting through it. Unfortunately, there's not much I can do. I'm in this office. It's more like a terrorist hideout location. <laughs> <laughs> hey, All right. I, I think what we need here is a steel cage match. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, here we come. <laughs> Segment number two in three, two, one. Welcome back to Experience the Buzz. I am joined by not one, not two, not three, not but four, four, four voices. Scott Marsh, Doug Kelly, Jason Ross, Steve McElroy. They're going to be calling the game this week. And what game is that? Well, Sac State versus UC Davis. We better know that as the Causeway Classic. Uh, Scott, let's go ahead and give out the details. If they want to listen to you and DK, where are they going to go? Fortunately, they're not going to be able to do that this year, Buzz. I'm actually doing the ESPN broadcast, and it's also going to be on Channel 31. So I'll be working with Scott Barry on Saturday. Doug Kelly will be working with Greg Wong, who's been doing a lot of the radio home games this year. So unfortunately, DK and I will not be together for this year's uh, Causeway. DK, are you sad about that? Well, yeah. You know what? You know, I mean, I worked so many games with uh, first with you and and then with Scott. Um, you know, a few about a month or so ago, uh, they asked me to total up how many total games I had done, and I'd lost track and uh, went back and had some old media guides. So I just go, yeah, yeah. I, well, I've missed three uh, for various reasons, but I've been there for two hundred and sixty-five or wow. something like that. So, um, so yeah, I'd I'd love to be working this game with uh, Brother Marsh. We could. Um, we could also argue the merits of the Dodgers and the Giants while we're at it, but um, but yeah, it's it's you know doing the TV is a great break for for Scott, and uh, I hope uh, something down the road comes for him on the uh, video side of things. And um, you know, Greg Wong is a very very talented young man. Uh, he's done baseball, he's done football. Most people around here know him as the voice of uh, UC Davis women's basketball does a great job on all of them sits in on the river cats games on occasion so uh, he's what i'd call an up-and-comer in the broadcast business and um you know we'll uh, we've we've worked well together we'll have some fun okay sounds good so that's the uc davis side uh jason and steve uh where can they find sac state football well i think that since scott and doug have severed their cohesion in their broadcast the only place to go would be ESPN 1320 radio. I love those guys. They're both fabulous broadcasters, but you know, you got to keep the band together. You know, David Lee Roth, Eddie Van Halen, you know, it doesn't matter. Jimmy Page, Robert Plant. We've got Jason and Steve, you know. And Danny. And Danny. Danny. And Danny. Yeah. And by the way, on the UC Davis side, who's, who is, the, do you have a sideline guy? Nope. Oh. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. Oh man, that, that, cause you know, when we were doing the broadcast, that was a big thing. You know, Scott, you were sideline reporter, Steve at some point, yeah. uh, we had our good friend, Scott Gordon. We've had many, Eric Hasseltine, a lot of them yeah. have, Bill, have Bill, Bill Horrenda was uh, Bill Horrenda. Movie. Yes. Yes. It's so yeah. funny. So as you guys like prepare for this, like, gosh, I was so excited that you guys all agreed to this and we can actually collectively come together, but talk about 
the preparation, like going into not only this game, but each game. That's the fun part for me as a play-by-play guy. That's the part I love the most. Give me the media notes, start building, you know, out the the notes for the game and stuff. And uh, Jason, we'll start with you. Uh, that's my favorite process too, Buzz. You and I have talked about that for years. It's it's just, it's such an easy way to do it all week. It's There's a constant theme. The best thing about Davis is now that we've all been, we've already documented how much, uh, how many of these we've been a part of, we know the history, we know the coaches. And the, the honest truth is every week, Steve and I are following what Davis is doing. We're either watching their game, listening to their game. We know what's going on. So there's already, you know, I've heard Scott and Doug say the names enough and quarterback and key positions and who makes tackles. So then when you get the notes and you see the prep, oh yeah, he's pretty good. You do already have a little bit of intel on who you've heard about and who you know. And then of course, some of the guys that are back again. So um, the prep is the fun. And then I feel like Steve and I start our pregame like Monday for the week. We just, our pregame is just talking all the way. We'll drive across the causeway doing the pregame. We'll drive into the parking lot. We're doing the pregame and then the actual radio is on and we're still going. So it's just a fun process. I love it. And for you, Scott. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Steve. Oh, I thought we were going side to side. The, the interesting thing about this is in a sense, the game notes aren't out yet. So usually I'll wait till Tuesday afternoon when the game notes came out, but I I've already been on the Aggie website going, why does their tight end catch so many passes? Cause that always scares me when that happens, but I will admit this. I don't know. And this is a good question for Scott. Where's Hunter? Because Hunter was a great quarterback early. Hunter in the Biden or. Well, I don't know. <laughs> don't mention oh. Hunter Biden, Steve. To, to, to Steve McElroy, that is. Because that'll start a whole different hour long conversation. Buzz. True. No, but where's Hunter Rodriguez? Because I don't know that yet. And I missed the part where he stopped playing because he was doing a great job at quarterback. Yeah. So Hunter was, for lack of a, a better phrase, put to the bench starting for the Cal Poly game. So Miles Hastings has been the starter for the last three games for the Aggies. Okay. So Scott, do you feel comfortable like giving out that that information? Like the, you know, those are nuggets that Jason and Steve can really run with. You got to be well, careful. I know, when, I know when McElroy goes back and watch the tapes of the prior three games, he'll see that Miles started in quarterback. So I'm not concerned about giving that away. But I will <laughs> say, I don't know if the coaches will will like Jason and I because we exchanged our game boards yesterday and. As you know, Dan Hawkins will not give out his two deeps because they're basically done in alphabetical order. And now McElroy has a copy of those also. So that that may not make Coach Hawk real happy. But I, I have to say, you know, I try to pattern my, my game boards after you, Buzz, because you had the best game boards of anybody in college football. I'll never forget the – first of all, I'll never forget the call that you had at Stanford in 2005. Oh, you and DK. It was such an unbelievable call. Um, right up there with Al Michaels with DK with the, the miracle call and of course you had the, the great call to, from John Grant to Blaze Smith and I was standing 10 yards next to that Oh my, oh, you just gave me chills. Wow. Yeah, yes. that was something. But the thing that I remember the most about that night was Ted Robinson standing in amazement looking at your game boards because he basically had some pencil scratch for Stanford, UC Davis, and you had these beautiful 10 color charts. <laughs> yes, indeed. Everywhere and like he was literally blown away by that. And so I'll never get to that standard, but you know, you start on Sunday and it's a week long process. I mean, you're going Sunday, filling out stats. I still use pencil personally. So I like to update every week and I like having larger boards so I can see it yep. versus people who get with real fine print. But I mean, it's every day, you know, Tuesday's the, the press conference and then Wednesday you're doing coordinator calls. And I mean, it's a full week of preparation. Okay. And so DK from a color analyst standpoint, it's a little bit different, right? I mean, you you don't really create boards, but you're obviously getting notes together. I like how Jason referred to the fact that there's a lot that you already know just based on what you've seen. But in terms of your preparation, maybe explain for the audience what it looks like from a color analyst view. Well, Steve, I try to come up with stuff that people can't find anyplace else. Uh, you know, Back when newspapers were really newspapers, uh, there was an awful lot of information in the sport page every day. Nowadays, you get a game played on Saturday and you might see a story on Tuesday. So uh, a lot of people who are going to be listening, uh, the other thing you have to keep in mind is keep it, keep it succinct and to the point because you can't assume that people are going to sit by their radio for, for three hours straight. There'll be you know, getting in and out of their cars, uh, you know, going to the, uh, 
whatever shop to pick up something, grabbing the kids from soccer practice, whatever it may be. So you you just try and keep uh, keep them involved. Um, you know, Scott uh, sometimes chides me because I can go off the reservation a little bit at times, but I think well, I people enjoy it. If I it. bring my 16th century English dictionary, I sometimes can't understand what Doug is saying. <laughs> Well, you got to understand, I'm a little older than you guys. So, um, as the great Gary Radich would say, I've been around a little bit. <laughs> you know, um, it's uh, uh, Jason is exactly right, though, because, you know, we, we each know so much about the other opponent. In, I won't say it's easier to prepare, but um, you have a little bit more of a frame of reference than if you're playing, uh, say, Youngstown State in week two. But, um, you know, I just I just look forward to the games. And one of the things I try to do is see what a team has done in the last two weeks. Are they playing well? Do they have momentum or have they staggered? Uh, um, you know, I, I was stunned last night that the 49ers played as well as they did. But um, you look for little things like that. And uh, momentum to me is a big thing. Uh, I think it's uh, extremely important, especially going into a, a rivalry game, because let's face it, a, a lot of these guys uh, competed against each other in high school or, or junior college. And uh, to answer uh, uh, Steve's uh, question, the reason that uh, our tight end is catching so many balls is because he's good. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. Well, the most voices that we have had on Experience the Buzz is happening right now. Quick reset for you. We've got Doug Kelly, Scott Marsh representing UC Davis. And on the Hornets side for Sac State, we've got Jason Ross and Steve McElroy. And we're just talking about preparation and what it is to be a broadcaster. And they've done it for so many years. We've talked about all the years uh, that they've been a part of not only Aggie or Sac State football, but this Causeway Classic in particular. And Jason, uh, you kind of spoke to game day. Like to me, like, yeah, it starts with the notes and you start building that vision of what game day is going to look like. And then you get to game day and maybe you and Steve can talk about it from your, your side and then we'll get DK and Scott's perspective. But I think this is important because people need to understand that, yes, there are professionals that do this, but there is a almost like a kid-like, you know, Christmas morning mentality. I know that was the way for me of just like Kristen would ask me, Steve, why are you going three hours before kickoff? Because I have to, because I've got to take it all in, right? And so maybe you can speak to that game day experience uh, when it happens. Jason, we'll start with you. You're spot on with that, Buzz. I don't know. Every Saturday is that way where I wake. It's Christmas morning. It's a good analogy. You wake up, you're just excited. You don't know what the three hour game is going to have in store, but you're just excited. And I love calling games. I love working with Steve and Danny. Um, and you don't know, there's no, you, you might have an opinion or a thought. We just referenced earlier a 2000 game. Steve and I were about as sure as you possibly could be in the causeway that the Hornets were going to win. They didn't win. Um, so it's the excitement, it's the anticipation, it's all the prep you've had. And then what are we going to see? Something historic, even the worst game, there's something in it, or we're going to see, you know, a great all timer that comes down to the last play. So I think it's the excitement of all that. I know um, we all have probably our little quirks. Steve and Danny always, you know, we're our own engineers. Those guys set up our equipment. They make fun of me saying when I leave the booth that I'm going to hair and makeup. But uh, I usually go down to the field, uh, test the the crowd mic and the, or the uh, sideline mic and see a few coaches and players. But uh, just the routine is is all part of it. And then who knows what's going to happen over the next couple of hours. Well, and I love that McElroy because, yeah, you guys still set up your own stuff. So you bring it. You set it up, and uh, usually, I'm sure it never fails, right? You've never had a failure of not being going going on the air, right, McElroy? Uh, not since our last game. And for the <laughs> but I'll be honest, I was actually kind of happy about it because our, our Comrex uh, disconnected from the station, but I knew it was the station's end because I know how to test it with the Comrex line. But I'm communicating on my phone with the producer, and... Uh, Jason was like, what's happening? I'm going to keep going because he's recording the game. So I said, yeah, you keep going. And he goes, well, let me give you the studio number and you call in. I said, we have to do it on Jason's phone so I can talk to you. And the universal fix for equipment always is unplug it and plug it back in. <laughs> so I knew it was on the studio end. So I was telling the producer, do you know the closet behind where you're sitting right now? 
unplug it and plug it back in because I can't reconnect with you. So, so that was the first time that's ever happened with this new equipment that we have. It used to happen all the time when you had the old hotlines and the other equipment, but I'm glad it happened before the playoffs. So at least the studio guy knows the universal fix to a television or anything else, either unplug your router or hit it and then it, and then it works again. But um, I just wanted to say something really quick. Buzz, you're amazing. And back when you did that Stanford call, for example, to show how the, our lives overlap with this group of people, it can't be more so with any other group of people because um, we've worked together for 25 years. Yeah. We were on a, a Muni train uh, or a, in Portland, Oregon when you guys beat Stanford. And Jason and I, he had called the studio line and we were listening to you and Doug's broadcast on a on a phone calling back when they didn't have internet when they didn't have the internet wow so we actually called into the 338 blah 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 number yes the, the, the little backdoor number to listen to your call so scott might have been on the sideline people have heard it but that just shows how our lives overlap because that was an incredible moment for you two guys and we were right there with you so that being said you know the the five of us overlap greatly in life and even though i'm the instigator i just I do it because it makes life exciting. I, I just want you to know that I admire and appreciate you guys. Oh, thank you. No, and when I say instigator, that is a true compliment because <laughs> you need that in this group, right? Otherwise, it would be too vanilla, you, you know? Need the bad guy. Exactly. <laughs> you know, it's funny. My wife and I have gone on a binge on Survivor. So literally, we have watched seasons all the way through, and now I feel like life is Survivor. It is. So you're, you know, you always got to have that person, the instigator to kind of rustle things up. So that's, that's you. And that's good. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> Let's switch over to, to DK. I, I, I got to tell you guys a story that, um, you know, Jason was talking about the game in 2000. Well, I remember one at um, uh, Hornet Stadium. And I'm going to guess and say it was around 2009, 2010. Uh, Davis had the little better team that year but they started a quarterback who was horribly ineffective i forget his name even but at the half and and scott and i were on up on the roof and the wind was blowing about 30 miles an hour it was cold as all get out i felt like i was in lambeau field and um at the beginning of the third quarter i looked down and i turned to scott i said scott we are in trouble and he goes, what do you mean? I said, well, that guy down there, that's McLeod Bethel Thompson. And he is 10 times better than the guy he's replacing. And sure enough, he threw the winning touchdown pass, I think, with nine seconds left in the game. And Only know, after, was. if you'll recall, the incomplete catch was rolled on third down on Carter's catch along the sidelines that would have won the game for the Aggies. <laughs> See, this is what I love about Marsh. Marshall totally come in. That, call yeah, and but that was the year where the Aggies would have finished seven and four, maybe if made the playoffs. Yeah. Well, it uh, unfortunately is both no, it didn't happen. About that. <laughs> but Mac, I can report that uh, I, I've stayed in touch with Mac over the years. He's the starting quarterback at the, Toronto Argonauts at the age of 33. Yes, I love Doug, it. If you'll recall, that was also the game where our tent, it was blowing so much that it actually blew into the stands before the game. And this is no joke, but if it had blown down during the game, it would have severely hurt people. Yeah, that's true. There was nobody in the stands at that point, but it literally blew right into the stands underneath that because the wind was blowing so hard that day. Well, I, I remember being cold. Yes. Folks. This is why it's not, you see, you guys think it's all roses. No, th there's a lot of work that goes in. And it's funny that you guys mentioned, you know, the, the setup and stuff. That was also, that was always the stressful thing for me is I know on the UC Davis side, because we are affiliated with Sports 1140, which is strange in itself, because think about this. Jason Ross is the program director, but yes, he is the voice of Sac State football on a different station. And then you have Scott who works at 1140. He broadcasts on 1140 and then you have DK. So when we were usually at home, we were taken care of. I know in the later years on the road, we were taken care of, but those early years, DK, yeah, we were responsible for setting things up. And that was always the most stressful thing for me is like, once we get into the press box, let's get that squared away, make sure we're on the air and then you can relax, right? DK, you remember those days? Oh, I remember them well. And, and now I can say that, you know, Scott is an absolute genius in putting the uh, equipment and making it, making it work and all the bells and whistles and 
little lights and you know i am uh, somewhat banned from the uh, booth until he's done doing <laughs> <his> <laughs> i tell doug to leave for a half hour when we arrive someplace so i can get everything set up all right so okay so this just brought up something like as far as like position in the booth talk about that because i'm sure you guys got it like locked down as far as being at home but like when you go on the road uh being in the right position do you guys look at each other and say hey i'm good on the left side you're good on the right or is there something in particular again i think the layman needs to know this jason and steve how about you guys first well i'll I set up the equipment and Jason might be similar to Doug. There was a time when I had the broadcast rights for St. Mary's College and Sac State for basketball a long time ago. And with the old hotline, I would send Jason on the road. Now, Jason is a fabulous broadcaster. He's one of the best people any of us have ever met, but his equipment usage. So I did a game at Gonzaga and he did a game at Eastern Washington. And I came home because I was closer to the hotel because it was in Spokane. I turn on the news and they're showing highlights and I see Jason doing the game on the telephone. And a few minutes later, he comes back to the hotel and I'm like, had to do the game on the phone, huh? And he's like, yeah, how did you know? I said, I just saw it on the news. And then one time I missed a game, I went to Chicago with my wife and he was at Cal Poly and I tune in to hear the game and there's no color commentator and no sideline reporter and it doesn't sound very good. So I text him and Jason's all, I'm on my phone. <laughs> <laughs> But Jason, Jason. Has to pick where he stands because he's play by play. I'm play by play for Sac State basketball, and I've always been a play by play announcer. But doing color, I absolutely love it for football because I get to really watch the game and do everything. And Jason's a true champion of a broadcaster. So he gets to choose because he likes to put a bunch of charts on the walls. He likes to be in a certain position if there's a TV monitor. So I um, let him completely choose uh, which side he wants. And right, usually Jason. he's on the left, unless the booth dictates the right's better. Anything to add to that, Jay Ross? I think Steve's right. I don't know if it's just instinct. Like at home, you know, I'm on the left. I think for the 99 times out of 100, I'm probably always on the left. I don't know. It, I don't know if that's just the way we set it up. But I was, man, Steve's telling stories about, I can remember. He's right. He's 100% right about my engineering <laughs> capabilities. They're awful. Um, not only that, there he used to have uh, the old, you know, when you probably get the Sports Illustrated subscription, you got a, the football flip phone, like a truly a flip phone. And there was one of the games I was doing again on the phone and I had, I was holding up the phone and buzz. I changed ears. And when I changed it closed, I hung up on myself on the broadcast, <laughs> had to open it back up, <laughs> dial up football flip phone. And, you know, doing a basketball game by yourself, isn't so bad. That Cal Poly game of football by myself with no analyst for three plus hours and likely a Hornet beat down was not fun. Scott and Doug, how about you guys on your side? What's it like, Scott? Doug gets whatever slim pickings are left after I've chosen what I've done. <laughs> and usually, usually I always choose the side that's got the best look at the scoreboard. So it doesn't matter okay. whether it's left that makes or right, sense. In some locations, you do not get to see the scoreboard if you're on one side or other of the press box. So... You know what's interesting is DK, I think we I was the opposite of Jason. I think I was always on the right side. Yeah, you everywhere were, we went. Yeah. You, yeah. You, so that's you always took the right side. And and you know, um I I can work anywhere. I mean, yeah, I, you're I, flexible. I, you're flexible, DK. Yeah, you know, I love that. <laughs> but uh, you know, one time we were in a booth that was uh, about the width or the length, I should say, of Wilt Chamberlain. That was about it. And um you know, so I was actually standing kind of behind uh, Scott. Um, That's Northern Colorado. Northern Colorado. Yeah, Northern Colorado. And um, uh, Vincent Jackson that day yes. caught like 12 balls or oh, something man. like that. Yeah. 244 yards. He went off. Yeah, he did. Yeah. But, um, you know, it's um, I, I think it's important, uh, whatever the uh, keeps the play-by-play -play guy comfortable, because he's really the guy who's, you know, the engineer of the train, so to speak. And, you know, guys like uh, Steve and myself, we're there to, you know, add some perspective, as it were, over and above the third and four from the 16, but day, 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 day. So it works. And with well, that, yeah, go I ahead, Jay. Say, I would say, Buzz, our, Steve and I, our uh, biggest fight, if, it, if there ever is one, is it the media meal. Like if there's Chick-fil-A, Steve is in a sprint to get Chick-fil-A. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's another thing to talk about is the spread. Like the spread, does any one, does any media spread stand out to you? This will be our last thing before the break. And then we're going to come back with great memories of either games or players or whatever it might be. But well, any... I'll tell you one that uh, uh, stands out. Northern Arizona had nothing to leave. <laughs> the opposite. The opposite. Scott? Does a really good job with that. I have to be honest. They, they always have great food in the booth. Uh, when we went to Cal, Cal was a, a tremendous spread, as you might expect, for a, a Pac-12 school. So, Okay. Jason, Steve? Oh, if I'm going... I did a game once at the University of Wyoming for basketball. And not only did I have the most comfortable chair that actually rolled, it was like a, a <laughs> it was like a custom chair, but the media spread was literally like a Thanksgiving dinner that one of the ladies had prepared. So nice. you had turkey and cranberries and gravy and everything in their media room. And I was like, are you kidding me? It's like, I didn't even want to do the game. I was going to say, tell the producer, hey, we'll pick it up like, two minutes into the game because I got to finish my dinner. Yeah. Homemade meal. I love it. And it's all about timing too. Cause you got to eat that food at the right time before you get on the air. Oh man. There's a, there's a whole thing too. This is bringing up a lot of great memories and speaking of memories, that's how we're going to finish out the program. We're going to take our second break. And when we come back, we're going to get into those memories with Steve McElroy, Jason Ross, Doug Kelly, and Scott Marsh more with experience the buzz right after this. Excellent. You guys doing okay on time? Yeah. Okay, perfect. All right, final segment. Here we go in three, two, one. It is final segment time. Experience the buzz, a special edition as the Causeway Classic will kick off this Saturday, 1 o'clock. It will be at UC Davis. We have Scott Marsh and Doug Kelly. They'll be representing the UC Davis side. And then, of course, Jason Ross and Steve McElroy on the Sac State side. We are going to put all the information that you need to know uh, in the show notes. But definitely check it out. It is a great game. And this one has huge implications in terms of the playoffs. Both teams doing well, sitting at 8-2. and two. So I thought we would finish out. It's been such a fun conversation, but memories, right? And uh, we've mentioned a few, and, and some were like swirling through my head, but I'm curious to hear what you guys have to say as well. So, Scott, when you think of memories, and I'm, I'm going outside of the Causeway Classic. This is in relation to kind of the five of us and this journey that we've been on. But, uh, Marsh, what sticks out for you? Wow, that is an open-ended question right yeah, now. Yeah, that's a pretty big one talked about Stanford and certainly that that stands out for me quite a bit uh, you know in terms of you know being able to to take over and do the play-by-play -play when we moved to um, Aggie Stadium now it's UC Davis Health Stadium that that opening game certainly stands out of course it wasn't a great memory for Aggie fans because it was over 100 degrees that day and on the field it was like 120 the, the Aggies ended up losing that game to Western Washington so it was a terrible debut for Aggie Stadium but I remember later in that year, that same year, we played San Diego when Jim Harbaugh was the coach. Fred Ark was in his final uh, game as defensive coordinator, the late, great Fred Ark. God yes. rest, rest his soul. Yep. And uh, one of the all-time Aggie greats. And uh, anyways, UC Davis came back in the final moments to win that game. And, and DK, to his credit, had one of the great lines. It was the miracle for Ark that day that the Aggies won that game against Jim Harbaugh. And that certainly stands out. Um, in terms of the Causeways, that triple overtime game back at Hornet Stadium in the 90s that you you had to call with DK certainly was was a total thriller. I'm still ticked about that Chris Carter incompletion. I can tell. <laughs> uh, you know, but uh, in 2018 with the Aggies and how good they were and the way they were rolling when they when they took care of business up in Reno against Sac State. That was just part of a special year. And Keelan Doss on that day broke so many uh, school records. And that certainly stands out. So it's been a, it's been a great run. And I know this year and future years are going to have so many more memories to offer here. Well, and, and for Scott, for you, I mean, just watching your journey has been great. And there was, I think, no better person to pass the torch to than yourself. Like you were the guy in the ranks. That was your spot. And uh, when I decided that, it was over for me. I was so glad to see you step in, and you have done a wonderful job. So I, I wanted to give you that compliment because I, I think maybe I've texted you to say, hey, great job and everything. But, Scott, very happy for you because as I sit here and look at you guys, I know we're older, right? We're older and stuff, but truly, I feel like a little kid in this conversation. Like, 
boys at the schoolyard, you know, at recess, just talking about stuff. That's how it feels to me. So, Scott, congratulations because you're doing a great job. Well, you set a very high bar, Buzz, so I just tried to live up to that, and uh, I appreciate those kind words very much. Let's move on to DK. Doug, you've seen a lot. There's been a lot of great memories. I'm curious of what comes out of the memory banks for you. Well, Steve, you know, Scott mentioned a lot of them already, but I remember the last game at Toomey. It was, the, uh, uh, I believe it was the last game at Toomey, but we were playing um, USD. Yes. And um, I forget who our sideline reporter was that day. Well, thanks for remembering that, DK. That was me that after. That was you. <laughs> and, and, okay. Well, and you and you must have had to go to a Kings game or something. I did. That's true. And uh, oh. <laughs> so uh, the, the, the deal was Scott had to leave. I was going to go down and do the post game on the field with Biggs. So we're up uh, a fair amount on on USD. So the the gun sounds. Game's over, and, and Bob says, uh, "Well, give me um, give me just a couple minutes to chat with Jim and." Then we'll do the interview. And I had, I told him no sweat because we got room for maybe two questions before we had to go to the Kings broadcast. So here comes Harbaugh across the field. And, you know, Bob's got his hand out to shake hands and, and Harbaugh just pirouettes and takes off running for his locker room. <laughs> Bob looks at me and I look at Bob like, what happened there? And uh, uh, we ended up doing the interview and that was that. And of course, the, uh, the next year moved into, um, Aggie Stadium and you know it's it's been it's been great ever since but you know I I think over and above some of the games the the thing I remember is you know a lot of the players that uh came up when I was just getting started you, you'll see them at various functions or at home games and you know it's just uh, so many of our guys who played have gone on to do some really great things in life not just in playing pro football, but, uh, in life. And I, uh, it was gratifying last, uh, last Saturday to see uh, Chad Sindel, uh, Chad Sindel is training to become a, a football official and he was the red hat at, um, last week's game. So I think those are the things that, that I enjoy the most is, is seeing, seeing these guys. And, you know, um, uh, I've worked, uh, all my career in some form of, uh, of football uh, started out in Kansas city and went to the USFL and then to NBC and then back out here. And so it, it's been a great ride. I've enjoyed it. Um, I still uh, much prefer winning over losing. I'm, I don't lose. Well, you can ask my wife, but um, uh, it's been a great, uh, it's been a great time. And I've enjoyed working with both of you guys immensely. You're, you're both consummate professionals and I'm very fortunate to have, had the ability to do that. And DK was our first game. Was it Humboldt State? Yeah. Was our, yeah. It, it was Humboldt. Humboldt. It was Humboldt State. Doug Dole had called me, or SID at the time. He had called me, and uh, he needed an analyst on short notice. So I was uh, <laughs> the analyst du jour. But I remember driving to Humboldt with Doug. Doug was in the front seat, and Bob Foster was driving. And Bob Foster loves to tell stories. And, and you know that the road to Humboldt is ra rather twisting and A little twisty. Uh, so here's Bob uh, talking, uh, uh, telling, well, you know, back in, uh, uh, you know, whatever year it was, we were down four with three minutes to go. And, you know, he's got his head to the side and the car is going like this. And I'm thinking, I may not survive this. <laughs> But uh, and John Shoemaker picked up an onside kick and went 50 yards for a score. Man, great memory. Yes. Um, uh, you know, Shoe's a doctor now over in, in England. But yeah, you know, you, you remember things like that. I, I can't tell you what I had for breakfast two days ago, but I can tell you about uh, a 50 yard kick return from 20 years ago. I love it. And I loved working with you, DK. I mean, just always so fun. And it's interesting too, because yeah, obviously you stuck, right? But prior to that, like, yeah, we had four or five come through, including, I mean, I know Ken O'Brien gave it a shot. Brian Wheeler was a color analyst, which is that strange in itself. Great NBA announcer. 
Um, you know, the late, great Jim Soker gave it a shot mm-hmm. and uh, probably one or two others. But DK, yeah, Chris, it was Chris always Collins, fun. Chris Collins did it for a yeah. while. Yeah, exactly. So, see, I moved here in 91 with uh, with the surge and our, our uh, radio team that first year was Joe Starkey and believe it or not, Ronnie Lott. Wow. And, and then the second year it was Joe and um, Jack Youngblood. But um, yeah, it's uh, Sacramento surge yeah. <laughs> going, going back in the history books. I love it. Now let's flip over to uh, Steve and Jason and see now you guys have had time to really think this out. Steve memories. Well, I'm going to go way back. No, first, <laughs> this, that back in 96, when I announced with Davis, with you and Doug, that game at Kingsville, we were a huge underdog and amazing way to win the game. I, I'll just skip past it. But the ironic thing about that trip, it was such an amazing win. So great. We got on the plane to come home and I fly all the time and turbulence doesn't bother me. That was the worst turbulence that even Bob Biggs and he played in Canada had ever had. And there was lightning strikes and we all thought we were going to die on the plane. And there were a few Aggie boosters on the plane that didn't look scared and everybody else was terrified. And they go, if it's our time to go, it's our time to go. But Not what you want to hear. <laughs> no. But skipping forward from that great memory with the two of you, I wanted to tie you guys in. Um, Scott was probably calling a Kings game and was no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> October 16th, I'm going way back of this year because Jason Ross and I, you know, we've had wins at Oregon State, wins at, um, you know, at Colorado, but we lost in 99 on a Jesuit high school a two Molden overtime catch against the Hornets. We were up 20 to nothing with Ricky Ray with the pitch game. And uh, we've always, we've had some terrible games in Montana, but we've had games we should have won there. And going there, we go to the same restaurant every time, the Depot, the most amazing steaks and mud pie in the world. And we love their fans. Their fans are so educated. They cheer when, you know, when they're supposed to, they're quiet when they're supposed to. So this year we finally got over the hump and beat Montana. And the greatest moment that Jason, I am sorry, I stole his story. Jason and I prepare for games, but because we're such close friends, we never talk about what we're going to talk about. It has to be organic when we go on the air. So we don't go, okay, we're going to go offense, defense, this and that. If you're prepared, you're prepared and you're ready for what the other guy says. Um, So it's the end of the game and our defensive coordinator, Andy Thompson, is an attacking coach. We're only up by seven. They have the ball and he still blitzes instead of going into the prevent. So we get a sack and now it's a big play. It's fourth down for Montana. And I'm all excited about it. I'm not a social media guy, Buzz. I have to find out about you from the neighborhood. My wife told me about one of your, about your experience, the Buzz. Oh yeah. (laughs) I do no social media because you guys know I have a loose tongue and I'd be banned from everything. So I go, you know what? I'm going to pick up my phone and tape this last play of the game. And we get a sack and we beat Montana for the first time. And I decide to pan it from the field over to Jason. And as I'm panning to Jason, Jason is panning to me with his phone. And he never ever tapes anything when he's doing his play by play. And we catch each other with our phones at the same moment. So to me, that was probably the the highlight of our 25 years together broadcasting was that we were thinking the exact same thing at the same time. I absolutely love that. That I mean, that's great. And it and those types of games are so monumental. And it's amazing because, like you said, it's a 25 year journey. But this moment you're talking about happened this year, and that's why you continue to go and do what you do. Jason, I'll give you the last word on memories. I mean, that's such a great one that Steve said because it was right. I didn't see him pick up his phone. He didn't see me pick up. I've never done that ever in all the games, all the plays we'd ever called. It just felt, wow, this is actually going to happen here. I want to document this. And then I'm doing it. And I, I don't know. It was, it was the timing that we turned. It's almost like we'd done this before, but we had never done that before, which was really bizarre. So it was really cool. Um, But yeah, you think of the memories. I, I can even go back. And for you and Doug, talk about your first game at Humboldt. I remember, I don't know why I remember so well, Stephen, our first game at Southwest Texas State in 97. You know, to me, it's kind of the outliers. What was weird in the game? Bad weather, hot temperature, lopsided score. We had a Hail Mary at Northern Colorado. I mean, things that you don't see all the time, I think, is what sticks out. A lot of the games blend together over the years, but you can can isolate some some great memories. And then even kind of tying it back to the causeway, we've talked about, the 2000 game quite a bit. Uh, 2018, I think, would be the other end of the spectrum was the probably the only time I ever went to a causeway thinking, 
the Hornets, they're not going to win. And they can't. And they didn't. It wasn't re- like they had no, it just didn't feel like they had a chance and the Aggie steamrolled them. But I've always, always felt there was a chance for either team. And those two outliers, I didn't think would be the case. And um, I think about streakers on the field when I was a student there. I remember at Toomey. Um, was it you? Other, well, I can't confirm nor deny. <laughs> um, and then uh, the other one, with, and speaking of outliers, I don't think has happened to any of you guys, to my knowledge, besides this game. I'd never done it at all with Steve. I know it was, um, I don't know what year, but it was Aggie Stadium, the worst rain ever. We actually had a lightning. Go- the, the game was delayed for at least an hour. We actually went away from the broadcast, went back to the studio. We were all talking in our booths. We were off for maybe more than an hour. And that was a causeway within maybe the last 10 years or so, maybe a little more, but yeah. it was a lightning delay and it was shut down and then they resumed play, but I don't think many fans came back. So it's, we've kind of seen everything and that's what makes it so great. Man, memories all abound. So as you guys were speaking, I was kind of formulating just my kind of my quick hit list. And, you know, the one that really comes to mind for me uh, is one of the Cal Poly games. Uh, in which Tony Kays caught a game winner, and obviously DK and Scott, you may have—I don't know if you went with us and were on the sideline I for this. There, but I believe that was '95. Yes, '95. So they came back and won in the last minute. I remember listening to you guys call that game. So here's the kicker: I took my two boys, Toaf and Max, and Zach. So at that time, they were—I don't know—nine, eight, and six years old. Okay, so you know the Cal Poly setup. Pretty, you know, pretty mediocre, right? Nothing extravagant or anything. We, I, I, let me preface this. On the road trip, we stopped at, I believe, Kentucky Fried Chicken was our choice. And we started doing predictions. This is something we would do as a family. When we would go to baseball games, football games, let's predict the score. And um, Toph had it, he missed it by like a point or two. But So that was the first part. That was pretty amazing. The fun part was at the game, they didn't have seats. They roamed around the entire game. In fact, there were times, DK, you may remember this, where I'm going, are those my boys over there with Zach? Like they were on the opposite side of the field. And I remember at the end, you know, when we were on our way back there saying, yeah, a lot of people were using cuss words and everything. There was a lot going on. I'm all, well, welcome to college football. Here's the best part. When they win the game, I'm looking. My two boys and Zach are running onto the field. They're running onto the field. They're celebrating. They're hugging the players. And I'm going, okay, this is great. This is what it's all about. And that ride home, as we know, when you win, the ride home is a lot easier. So that one sticks out to me for sure. And so I you know, I think of rivalries, not only with Sac State, but Cal Poly obviously being the other big one. Would you agree, Scott and DK? Oh, yeah. For no, sure. I mean. For Davis, I think Cal Poly was an equal rival for a lot of years because just there was such an, I mean, you look at the total numbers and at one point it was like 20, 20 and two in the rivalry in terms of the split. And, you know, UC Davis has had great success with Sac State over the years. And certainly Sac State's had their teams and their moments and certainly are excellent this year. But it's been a little more one-sided overall. Plus, there's always the same conference. UC Davis and Sac State were in the same conference for a number of years like-minded institutions. Cal Poly UC Davis like to present themselves as two of the best academic institutions in the state. Ag schools, all that stuff. Yeah, and DK wanted to add to that? Well, I, I think there's two rivalries. One one is the city rivalry, you know, and it's a lot like um, something you're familiar with, Steve, UCLA and USC, uh, you know, both in Los Angeles. Uh, we're, we're separated by what, 14 miles between Sacramento and Davis. Uh, so th- there's that rivalry and, you know, it's the one that uh, is certainly the most easy to remember. But to Scott's point, uh, UC Davis and, and Cal Poly are, are so much alike in, in many respects, uh, academically, athletically, uh, you name it. Uh, unfortunately, there's no easy way to get there and uh, yeah. you can't fly in. And so it's... Uh, Every other year, you know you're in for a long bus ride. You make it, making the drive on on 41, crossing over and down yep. the, down south. Yep. And then lastly, uh, and we mentioned many times the Stanford game, no doubt. It's interesting because I actually have a regret because my regret is based on what happened at Cal Poly, taken in that moment, my kids roaming around. There was a discussion. Hey, Dad, are we going to the Stanford game with you? And I just felt that because it was in Stanford Stadium and because of that setup, I wouldn't be able to get away with what I got away with at Cal Poly. 
So I didn't take them. And you know what? They let me hear it every time. Dad, can't believe you didn't take us to the Stanford game. Steve? How, how old are your boys now? Well, we got 26 and 23. Oh, but, because <laughs> since you brought your kids into it, which is the greatest thing in life is passing that on to the future generation, um, that the apple doesn't fall far from the tree or whatever the saying is, I want Jason to tell a story about my kids at the causeway. Please, Jay. It really should come from Steve as a proud parent on this one, but I'll try to set, tell it the best that I can. It's a pretty proud moment for Steve. Um, it was at Aggie Stadium. I don't know how many years ago it was, but uh, a kick going to the direction of the grass berm over there, which is, you know, a beautiful place for fans to, to check out the game. And, um, you know, each team kicks their football, right? That's a Davis football or a Hornet football. And Steve, it was an Aggie kick, correct? I don't Well, I, well, we'll see. I'll just go with what I remember. Anyway, the kick was kicked through the uprights and made, and a young fan caught it. Well, it was one of the young McElroys that caught the ball. And generally, okay, send the ball back, send the ball back. Well, when there's two McElroys present, really three in the stadium total, but the two younger boys were available, they had set up a scheme. And uh, the younger one, I, I think it was the younger one caught it, uh, Jason, and then who threw it to older brother Trent. It might have been the other way around, but farther up the uh, kind of the concourse and they made way with the, the football. They got a game day football. <laughs> it was the Brother fake, scheming. The fake pass back to the field and then a reverse pivot throw up to the food truck at the top of the grassy knoll walkway. And then the other kid ran away with it in his sweatshirt. Wow. So that was a proud moment. Well, gentlemen, this is what I finished with. This conversation, this is what it's all about. For me and that's this is what i've loved about broadcasting and being in these kind of these communities of people um you know i think of all that i've done but the uc davis thing was definitely very special for me and it had a lot to do with you know the five that are here but in addition just the people that come along the way the coaches that we've talked about the players that we've talked about and obviously the games that have transpired but it's really the memories that we've been able to create and it's beautiful because even on rivalry day you know, we got the instigator, Steve. You know, we got that. Scott gets a little edgy because he's really into the, you know, the rivalry. I, see, I'm not into it as much. I just want a good game. And obviously, you want UC Davis to win. I think, DK, you kind of stand in the middle. And Jay Ross, you're just a nice guy. I mean, you you know, you're you're good either way. Your cup, I thought I was cup half full. Your cup, like three quarters full, which I, I really do appreciate. So with this rivalry, guys... Um, first of all, I just say thank you to all of you for taking this time to do this. So I want to give each of you the final word, whether it be on the game, the rivalry, whatever you want to say, and then we'll close the book on what I think has been a great conversation. Scott, we'll start with you. Appreciate that. No, I mean, it, the other thing that always is about the rivalry that's so much fun is just not only the 14 miles apart, but there's so many families that have split uh, loyalties. You know, my sister went to Sac State, so we always have a great time this week talking about things. And in the case of Jason, you know, I, I kiddingly call him Benedict Arnold for transferring over the Sacramento State. And you've got a quarterback in the Causeway who started at Davis and now will be starting over at Sacramento State in this game. So there's so many great things. And I remember when I was sideline reporting and you would see somebody in green sitting next to somebody in blue or just all of those fun times and the tailgating beforehand, especially over at Sac State where the tailgating is so great in that parking lot and you're just able to hang out with friends hours before the game. You know, I would normally just hang out in the booth before a game and get ready, but for the whenever there's a causeway, I always try to go down to the tailgate and just have fun and get so many friends and people wanting tickets. And with this year, with the excitement with both teams and both teams at eight and two and everything on the line, it just makes it that much more special. I, I can't wait for this game. All right, DK, to you. Well, um, first of all, it's fun. And, and football is supposed to be fun. Uh, uh, my wife worked for 30-odd years and recently, well, not that recently, but retired from Sac State. So back in the days uh, when the causeway would roll around, uh, it'd be a little quiet around the household in, in the week leading up to the game. But um, it's... Uh, no, I, I just, um, I'm kind of with Scott. I mean, uh, the, the interesting thing when the, for me personally, when the causeway is at Sac State, 
I'm, I live so close. I walk to the game. Yeah. I, I think I'm the only broadcaster in America that walk that can walk to a road game, but uh, you know, it's all, it's all good. It's all good. And uh, as for this weekend, um, it's, it's going to be a tight game. It's going to be a tight game. I, I don't, pretend to know how it's going to unfold anybody that says they they know is maybe but um i just think it's going to be a great day out at uh, uc davis health stadium and you know let's be honest the team that does better on uh, offense defense special teams red zone and uh, turnovers that's going to be a team that wins the game. DK, you officially can't give out your Kelly's keys until right before kickoff. Those are all sponsored. <laughs> well, that, that, that's, that's, that's probably a good thing because I haven't come up with them yet. <laughs> all right. Hey, Steve, as we finish this up, what are your final words? My final words is let's have some honesty. You know, if our team wins, it's going to be one of the greatest days ever. This game has something big riding on it. What that is, is I think the winner gets a bye, is one of the eight teams with a bye. And I think the loser has to play the following week in the playoffs. So even though we can't say, you know, it, it's technically for a conference championship for Sac State, but the key is one team's playing for a bye, one team's probably not. And Jason Ross might be the nicest guy in the world and we might tout him. I guarantee you, even though he went to Davis, Jason is going to be as happy and giddy. Look at the little smile on his face. <laughs> if the Hornets win this game, he's going to be giddier than heck. And if the Hornets, like he was in 2019 when we played, and the Hornets won and got a co-conference championship, 2018, we're lucky that we didn't drive off of Donner Pass after that game. So <laughs> we can pretend like, oh, it's a game and X's and O's, and oh, it's about the memories and the people and the dogs that go to the bathroom on the field at Toomey Field, and now we've got a beautiful stadium. No. We're going to be happier than heck. I went to a bachelor party in Tahoe after one causeway that we lost in heartbreaking fashion and drove up on the windy roads of Highway 50, got sick on the way, got to the party, didn't even feel like drinking. So I ended up being the designated driver, was absolutely miserable, didn't have to have a place to sleep. So I slept outside on the deck. The causeway is important to us. You're either <laughs> joyfully happy or you're miserable. And so let's just admit that. And I can Telling it like it is. Honesty. Jason, you get the final word. Well, I hope the Hornets win for Steve's sanity. Yeah, no oh, kidding. <laughs> um, you know, it's funny, though. It's a tie at all. I mean, there's, I think there's truth in all of this. There really is. I mean, yes, of course, Scott and Doug want Davis to win. Steve and I want Sacramento State to win. We have the – and what I always used to remember when there was the Causeway luncheon all the time, and when you hear it year and year, especially Coach Biggs, who's just the most wonderful human being out there, one of the things he would say in a lot of his uh, yearly causeway speeches is it's about the relationships and I'm like, yeah, yeah, but he's right. I mean, he is, it's about the relationships for me. That's where it was when I was a Davis student in my first couple of years, still working with Davis. I was so connected. Those were the relationships I'd made. Well now, I mean, I know all the coaches, their family, their wives, their kids at Sac State, athletic director, president, fans, boosters. Those are the relationships. You're so closely connected. So that's how it's easily you get connected now to Sac State. I mean, for this long, I mean, I, I want the Hornets to win. I mean, I, but I do have one secret goal. I think as much as I rooted for this scenario to have both teams playing for this, my, if I'm going to get greedy, my secret goal is to play a second time this year. I want it to happen again. Let's have it in the playoffs. Let's go. Causeway Classic Roundtable has officially come to a close. What a great conversation. My thanks to Scott Marsh, Doug Kelly, Steve McElroy and Jason Ross. Make sure you tune in. You've got three options on the TV in channel 31. Scott Marsh will be doing that. DK will be on the radio side for UC Davis on Sports 1140 KHDK. And then don't forget, you can get a little taste of Sac State flavor. That would be Steve McElroy and Jason Ross on ESPN 1380. Again, everything will be in the show notes. That's all I got for now. Talk to you next time. Goodbye, everyone. Nice job, guys. Thank you. This, like, yeah, it's brought, thank brought you. Me joy. Brought me thank joy. You. Yeah. It's good to have you guys all back. I might send out the video too. We'll see if you guys are okay. Do I have your permission? Sure. Okay. Sure. I'm not wearing pants. <laughs> McElroy, sure. sure. My lighting isn't right. I look all. Oh, stop, stop it. Stop it. Hey, um, <laughs> hey, Buzz. Yeah. Are you able to do an edit clip of, of you at the end? 
because Marsh is on ESPN Plus instead of on Channel. Oh, 5. okay, got it. Okay, it's no, it's both. It's, both. it's both, Steve. Oh, it's both. Okay, it good. Is. Oh, you're both. Yeah, they're simulcasting. Oh, the good. Okay, okay. We're thir- ESPN Plus. Okay, sorry about that. We're thirteen twenty, not thirteen eighty, though. Yeah. Sorry, I knew I'd mess something up. It so I'll matter. I'll put it I'll put it in the show notes. I'll put the links. Whatever. You're pretty close to perfect buzz. Yeah, and you know, I'm I was 60 off. I was 60 off. <laughs> okay. Um thanks for putting this together though. This was really Yeah, fun. yeah thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Steve. Thank this you guys. Been, this might be our pregame show. Let's edit exactly. this and put it on. There you go. Use <laughs> you what you need to. to take this material and, yeah. Absolutely. You got my full permission. Hey Scott, I, I promise that I'll like you and you'll still be my friend on Sunday. <laughs> sounds good are we friends now (laughs) well we're getting closer to game time once the game notes come out we're no longer friends just for a short period of time (laughs) okay fair enough and doug you can always be a friend just because you can walk to sax tape (laughs) all right guys peace (laughs) we'll see you guys thank you okay all righty bye